Yo, 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 yo. What's good with it? It's your homie Mac, reporting live from the Dogon. Peace and love to all. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, 82 Kings. Follow the movement on Instagram, at, at MacTV underscore 82. Uh, yeah, man. Um, you know, I appreciate everybody that's been showing love to this channel. It is growing at a fast rate, exponentially. Um, I appreciate everybody who's shown love, support, told their mama, their daddy, their they girlfriend, their boyfriend, their significant other, you know, cousins, about what we got going, over, going on over here at Mac TV, um, music, art, culture, knowledge. I uh, appreciate all the support. We just uh, cracked 500 subscribers. So that's a milestone. Um, the goal is one, one, uh, what, twelve hundred or better. So we're gonna keep this thing pushing. Keep telling your folks, tell your folks to tell your, to, to tell your folks, to tell their folks about what we got going on over here at Mac TV. Uh, but yeah, um, R.P. to Breonna Taylor. R.P. to Ahmaud Aubrey. R.P. to George Floyd. R.P. to to everyone that we have lost, irrespective of race, um, not on the All Lives Matter tip, but I'm just saying, like, everyone who has unjustly been murdered by the police, uh, it very much feels like we live in a fascist state when it comes to the, to the police, because it's almost like, not even almost like, <laughs> the police are like, are, again, not like, the police are essentially a standing army that's not subject to really any scrutiny, they can kind of just do whatever they want to do. And they're allowed to get away with it. Uh, but I believe that justice will prevail. Praying for uh, everyone who's lost a loved one to not only, you know, police brutality, but to COVID-19. You know, it's, it's crazy. Like, we're in the middle of a pandemic cycle. We, 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 have to, we have to deal with microscopic fiber optic genetic hazardous, hazardous genetic material, <laughs> as well as police. Um, but yeah, real quick, this is another session of Mackin' with Mac. This is long overdue, uh, but it's right on time. Um, the book, and we all know Mackin', Mackin with Mac is the uh, book review series <coughs> that we do over here. Um, the book I will be reviewing today is Bloods. See that? Bloods. Ooh. Bloods by Wallace Terry. Um, essentially, this book is... Uh, an oral account of black Vietnam veterans. Um, they delve in this book. They, in this book, um, we delve into what Mr. Terry, R.P. Wallace Terry. He delves into their experiences in the military. He he interviewed guys from the Navy, from the Marines, Special Forces, Army, the whole gamut, all military service that uh, you know our, our, the service and uh, their involvement. Their experiences, their first-hand accounts of being involved in the Vietnam War. So let's give a quick overview of the Vietnam War. Um, the Vietnam War lasted from like, I want to say, yeah, from like 55 to 73. Um, Eisenhower had, was an incumbent during this time. JFK was an incumbent during this time. Lyndon Baines Johnson was an uh, incumbent during this time. Nixon was an incumbent. Uh, the homie Gerald Ford was an incumbent, so that just lets you know that this was a uh, this war lasted <laughs> quite some time. Um, yeah, so what was it over? Um, essentially, uh, there was a concept called the domino theory. Domino theory meaning that uh, you know, the spread of communism, Red Scare, the idea that uh, communism was somehow supplant, overthrow um, capitalism. And as a Western, as a major Western power, I mean, this is essentially Cold War shit, Cold War, arms race. Uh, not only not only an arms race, but uh, just uh, um, a, a rush to just a rush to pretty much just preserve your uh, economic infrastructure, because we know <laughs> essentially um, the countries that late the, the uh, initially. Wait, hold up. Give me a second. Initially, Vietnam was a uh, part of French Indochina. It uh, essentially not yeah was a uh, essentially Vietnam was um, a colony. Don't quote me on the Indochina part, but Vietnam was a colony of France, 
and France lost their muscle, they lost their hand, they lost their control over the situation. And essentially, uh, Vietnam, the, the, the threat was that uh, Vietnam was going to become a communist nation and that Russia, Red Scare, was going to create a satellite in Vietnam. And before you know it, capitalism will be overthrown. So understand, this is about money, economics. Uh, a lot of people felt like this was a war for nothing. The thing that really sucks is a lot of the uh, people that came back, black and white soldiers alike, when they came back from Vietnam, they were not respected. It wasn't even considered a war. Some people just said it was a military conflict. Um, I want to say over 3 million lives were lost. A lot of them were civilians. Uh, what else? You had, uh, I think there were over 50,000 U.S. soldier, soldier casualties. But the thing is, like, the, depending on who you ask, we really didn't, we didn't win the war. I mean, Vietnam <laughs> essentially... Uh, did not yield to our way of thinking, to our politics. Uh, Ho Chi Minh, um, who actually was a student of Marcus Garvey, a lot of people don't know that. Uh, <laughs> Ho Chi Minh, uh, you know, let, let the front, and um, essentially, what I wanna say, Henry Kissinger signed, I think it was called the Paris Accord. Let me, let me check my notes. Basically, the Paris Accord was, uh, yeah, the Paris Peace Accords was just basically white flag, white flag, it's over. Um, interestingly enough, Kissinger and the North Vietnamese representative Le Duc Tho, um, they both were low, they both were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1973. Now, rumor has it that even though after this uh, Paris Peace Accords was signed, uh, there was some reconnaissance work going on, and the U.S. military went back into Vietnam. But shh, we'll just keep that on the wraps. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, because you wonder, like, why, why did they go back after a peace treaty was signed? Um, but, yeah, you can Google it, Google it. Um, real quick, um, this, this, uh, this war, also primarily known as the Vietnam War, it was also known as the Second Indochina War. Um, some of the, it was the Viet Cong and the National Liberation Front that essentially went to war with the U.S. military. And uh, that's a broad overview of uh, a broad overview with broad context, quick quick and dirty of Vietnam War, the players that were involved, and, you know, what took place. But real quick, Bloods. Let's get to the book Bloods. Um, a lot of times when people uh, review this book, like I said, this book is a series of different oral accounts of black soldiers who served in Nam. But a lot of times when people review this book, they always reference the account of uh, Haywood, the kid, Haywood T. the kid Kirkland. He's actually, the, he's from D.C. Shout out to my people in the district, Southeast Anacostia, was Gucci. Um, was good with it. Uh, they, um, they, they always reference Haywood T. the kid Kirkland. They give his account. And a lot of times that is done because Anthony Curtis, um, the primary character, um, of uh, of uh, the movie Dead Presidents, but directed by the Hughes brothers, Lorenz Tate played him, Anthony Curtis. Um, his character was designed after Haywood T. the Kid Kirkland. They said that uh, Mr. Kirkland actually met up with the Hughes brothers, I, I was told, and uh, gave his account and told them about, you know, what led to him going to the war, um, his political awareness that ensued thereafter, to criminality, again, being incarcerated. I think he did five years, and then he got out. I think he became a member of the Morris Science Temple. And uh, he actually, um, you know, told the government, F you, <laughs> you know, uh, wrote a letter, appeared in court, just talking about the different ways that uh, different inmates were, inmates were mistreated. But let's get to the book. I will, the person that I will be giving an account of is Sergeant, Ma Sergeant Major Edgar A. Huff of Gadsden, Alabama. He was, a set, he was a Sergeant Major of the 1st Military Police Battalion from May 1967 to July 1968. 3rd Marine Am Amphibious Force, October 7th through April 1971. U.S. Marine Corps, real deal, Devil Dogs. Salute to the Devil Dogs. Um, yeah, but let me give you a, a context for black soldiers. 
uh, from my research, things that I read this book from from me reading this book and things I found on out on the periphery, uh, there were a lot of black soldiers who uh, were murdered by friendly fi friendly fire. They were murdered intensely by their white counterparts. So imagine you've been on the front line and you got some racist hillbilly dude who doesn't like black people and he supposedly loves his country. He's shooting friendly fire, killing the black soldiers. And um, not only that, there are, there are accounts of soldiers saying, um, black soldiers that is, saying that uh, white soldiers were burning crosses. They were freaking burning crosses in Vietnam. Can't serve two masters. Are they serving the government? Or are they serving white? Are they, are they serving America? Or are they serving white supremacy? Some people say the two are one and the same. But they all claim to serve God too. But anyway, um, yeah, dealing with that, uh, 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 even, and even there are multiple accounts in this book um, where people said that uh, when they would go into Vietnam, the people in Vietnam were like, why are you here? You're not supposed to be here. We, we don't have no beef with you. You're not even free in your own land. We got beef with the white man. So can you imagine being over there? You're, you're dealing with uh, you know, conflict from within, your, from within your battalion. They want to put you on the front line so you can die first. You got white boys shooting at you. <laughs> yeah, you, you see people burning crosses. You know, a lot of these cats, you know, a lot of the brothers, they, they came from the country, came from the hood. And, um, let me get, let me get to it. I keep talking about this. Uh, Edgar Huff, again, um, Sergeant Major in the Marines, uh, from Gaston, Alabama. When he, uh, went to Camp, no, there, well, he went to Camp Lejeune, but there was something called Manford Point, which was, uh, Manford Point. Let me double check. Let me double check. Montford Point. Montford Point um, was basically a Negro Marine regiment where they trained them there. They trained them separate from the white soldiers. Um, he went there. I think he said he had like a dollar and fifteen cent in his pocket. Went went to uh, Montford Point. Went through his basic training, and um, there was a guy named uh, Colonel Woods who was pretty much. Over, oversaw his um that that the black regiment's uh training at Montford Point, and um during his time when he was at Basic, well shortly thereafter after after Basic, his mom he got a telegram and his mom was telling him like he's sick he needs to come home, so Mr. Huff Edgar Huff, actually um got on the butt the start the um I want to say Colonel Woods gave him some money, it was like look man here's fifteen dollars my this is like in the forties fifties. He <laughs> gave him some money, gave him $15 and was like, yo, go home, see your mama. Mr. Huff hops on the train, uh, uh, hops on the bus, uh, en route to Alabama, stops in Atlanta. Some police officers see him um, in, his Marine, in his Marine uniform and they say, wait a minute, hey nigger boy, there aren't any nigger Marines. You're impersonating a, you are impersonating a freaking Marine. So what happened? He was arrested. He's arrested in Atlanta. He's in jail. He's sitting here thinking like, wait a minute, bro. Like, I'm not impersonating a Marine. I'm like, I'm, I'm a real devil dog. Who are? Like, I'm a Marine. And they're like, no, we don't believe you, nigger boy. There's no way. Um, so he ended up having to, he was talking to the people like, look, I'm really a Marine. But to make a long story short, he convinced somebody to get in touch with Colonel Woods. And he got out. He was able to see his mother. Um, but yeah, um, real quick, he... Mr. Huff went up the, went up the ladder, became a sergeant major in the Marines, and he talks about how, uh, you know, he, he had to could deal with so much racism. Like at one point, um, when he became a sergeant major, uh, one of his soldiers was like, yeah, man, um, talking to him on the phone, not knowing it was a white soldier, not knowing that Edgar Huff was uh, a black man, says, yeah, man, I, I'll do whatever I do. I love the core, but... Uh, just don't don't put me in a room in no barracks with no niggers. I don't want to have a nigger roommate. Not knowing the whole time that Mr. Huff is black. But anyway, this soldier comes through. He sees Mr. Huff and he's like, oh shit, you're the sergeant major? Yeah. And uh and the guy when he was on the phone, he had told uh Sergeant Major Huff, I would rather pitch a tent outside by the pole than to have a a, a a nigger roommate. So Huff was Sergeant Major Huff is like, look. Remember what you said, how you don't want a black roommate? So what does Sergeant Major Huff do, do? He gets a tent, and he pitches it out by the pole for this white soldier. And all of a sudden, it just starts pouring rain. 
and the sergeant and, and the white soldier comes to the sergeant major's barrack. I mean, uh, quarters. He's like, man, please, can I just? I'll stay in the barracks. I don't care if I gotta have a a, a black a black. He's no longer a nigger. He's black. A black a black roommate. I'll I'll do it. And he and sergeant major's like, you gotta ask your sergeant if he's okay with it, then you can go. Lo and behold, the sergeant's like, you know, you know, he's like, okay, you can stay. <laughs> you can come in. So I, always, I thought that account was interesting. Um, let me give you another account. Um, he talks about uh, what else? Mr. Huff said a lot. I want to give a quick account of uh, the, the bravery that he showed in Nam. What? Let's see. Rick was hollering, "Mother, mother, I can stand it no more." I started out, and this is why this is this is during combat. And the colonel said, "No, no, just wait, just wait." I said, "Sorry, colonel, this wasn't a black boy. He was a white boy. I knew I might get killed saving a white boy, but he was my man. That's what mattered." And I took off, ran through an open field. They were firing from a tree line, and I got maybe 20 yards, and I was hit on the head. It was my helmet, and it spun me around, knocked me down, and I got up and started again. And another round hit me on the side of the helmet and knocked me down again. And I jumped up and then and I started running. Then I got to him and they opened up everything they had right there into that position. And I fell on top of him to keep him from being hit again. And the fragmentation grenade hit us. It ripped my flat jacket off into pieces. And it got me in the shoulder and the arm. Then our people opened up all they had. When I to this day I still got pieces of uh, I still got pieces of metal still in me. And my wife still digs them out when they start coming up to the skin. They gave me the bronze star for pulling Rick out. And Rick wrote me this letter. It says, Sergeant Major, I thank you for my life. Hell, he was one of my men. Black or white, I would have done the same. Even if I got shot, shot to hell in the process. And I was 48 at the time. But yeah, um, Edgar Huff, uh, Sergeant Major Huff, extraordinary, extraordinary gentleman. Right hand, right hand salute. Salute to you, uh, Mr. Huff, Sergeant Major Huff. And, uh, and in, the, in the book... He